Well, it is 9 a.m. Pacific, and we're going to get started here. My name is Tiago Forte. I'm calling in from Long Beach, California, which is just south of Los Angeles. Uh, I can see in the chat we have people from every corner of this planet, Montreal, Philadelphia, Germany, Edinburgh, China, Sao Paulo, North Carolina, Canada, Israel, and the list goes on. It's tremendously exciting. I'm very excited to unveil, to present to you a brand new workshop that I've been working on the past couple of weeks that really gets to the heart of my work and the heart of what I think is one of the most important frontiers in modern learning and productivity and uh, self-improvement, which is digital note-taking, also known as knowledge management. How do you store how do you capture, how do you organize, and then how, to, and then how do you use your personal knowledge, your ideas? So I wanna give you a quick introduction to Zoom before we dive in. We have a lot to cover, so we're gonna move fast. So put on your seatbelts and let's do this. So if you're not familiar with Zoom, probably many of you are, but there's a couple things I wanna point out. First is the chat. If you click the chat button in your toolbar, a window will pop up on the side. And I actually encourage you to have a very, very active chat. I'm gonna mute everyone here. Um, the reason for that is this is not just a one-way presentation, it's actually kind of a collaboration. This is why I call it a workshop, not just a webinar. Um, I'm going to be checking into the chat often for questions, for clarifications, very often, you all have many ideas and tips and tricks and apps to share as well. Uh, I'm only one person, you are 388, 389 so far. And I will share alongside a recording of this call, the full chat transcript minus any private messages. You can also private uh, message any person if you click the little field where it says to in case you want to send any private messages, but I will share the full chat transcript. So you don't have to worry about taking notes and furiously copying and pasting. I will have all of that for you. Second is your video. If you have any way to turn on your video, if that's possible, um, I actually like to see your faces because it gives me a sense of who you are, where you're coming from. I can also sort of see patterns of what's interesting, what's not, what's boring, what's exciting. And the amazing thing about this being a live call is that I can adapt and respond in real time and I'll do my best to do so. So I encourage you to turn on the, to turn on your video if that's possible. And third thing is you should be muted by default. Go ahead and keep the mute button on. Um, if I hear some background noise or anything, I might mute you. Um, but the reason we do this kind of conference style instead of webinar is I may ask you to type in the chat or to actually turn on your mic and to just speak and ask me something. Um, so that's a little orientation on Zoom. Any questions about Zoom or how this call is going to be conducted? Go ahead and put that in the chat. Okay, I just want to get that out of the way. There is a raise hand feature which we usually use, but I think with nearly 500 people, that's not gonna really be feasible. I'm gonna ask you to just put everything in the chat. Okay. Okay, I don't see any questions about the, um, so the notes to the workshop, I will share that as well, both the slides that I'll be presenting, and um, at the end of this call, for those of you attending live only, I will have a, a notebook. Oh, I'm gonna mute you all here. I will be sharing the notes or the notes that I'll be that I'll be showing you at the end as well. Okay, looks like we're pretty good on the logistics. Um, let's get into it. We're gonna take 60 minutes. We'll end right on the hour. I'll take questions toward the end. Uh, may pop in a few times into the chat before then as well. Um, but we have a lot to cover. I have a lot to share with you. So let's get into it. I, I almost can't even really keep up with the chat. That's gonna be a challenge. <laughs> okay.
So this is the how to take a digital note workshop. That's me in the photo. Um, and really the purpose of this workshop is to get to the very heart of what it means to take digital notes. Right, we, this is something I've realized recently as many of you have written to me asking, okay, I get some of the later stages and, and that's usually what I tend to concentrate on. But many of you ask like the, the exact moment, like what is the exact thought process right at that moment you're reading a fascinating pa passage and you decide to take a note. What does that look like? What is that? What is, how does that actually work? Um, this is all the content you're going to see here is excerpted. It's taken from a course that I teach called building a second brain. This is actually the last we've done a whole month of emails and events and bonuses and different things. And this is the last one before enrollment opens tomorrow for the 10th cohort, the 10th group of people that is going through this course. Um, the enrollment opens, the cart opens tomorrow morning and is open for about a week until April 3rd. And then we kick off the cohort, which is five weeks long and has 10 sessions. Uh, we kick off on April 6th. And it's actually the same time, all the calls are the same time as this call. And I did that so you can kind of look at your schedule and decide, okay, is this time of day doable for, for me? Is it feasible? And if it's something that you decide to join, if this, if this material is something you find interesting and valuable, then you can take action on that starting tomorrow. And I'll tell you more about the course at the end of this call. So here's what we're going to cover. Um, we're gonna cover what to save, what to take notes on, what to keep. Then we're gonna talk about how, how exactly do you do that? And then we'll zoom out to the big picture at the end and talk about why, why you might wanna save all the stuff, why it matters why it can have such a, a huge impact on your work and your life. Okay, so let's start with what to save. Okay, I'm getting some requests, oops, oops, okay. Um, let's start with what to save. This is kind of my general guidance about um, what you should think about keeping. So in the middle is your second brain, which is what I call your system for digital note-taking, your system for knowledge management. And some of the criteria that I really have in mind as I read and listen to different things is what is inspiring. So let's start at the top left. Uh, is this something that can inspire me if it surfaced at some point in the future? That's the question I ask myself. And inspiration is an interesting thing because you can't do a Google search for inspiration. Right? There's a lot of things you can Google, but if you're just feeling down, if you're in need of motivation, if you need to be creatively inspired, if you need the spark of an idea, that's not, you can't really Google an emotion or a feeling or a state of mind. And so that's one of the primary things I like to keep. I, I have, for example, one Evernote notebook um, that is just testimonials. And I use that, I, I go in there anytime I need uh, a, a pick me up, right? Anytime I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm just, it's, this isn't going anywhere. I'm, I'm frustrated, I'm feeling blocked. I can go in there and see all the quotes of people that I've helped and that kind of reminds me why I do what I do. The second is, is this potentially a useful source building block or tool for future projects? And we'll get into this in a little bit when I show you a bunch of examples, but this isn't how we normally think of information. We probably think informative, we think insightful, but useful is really one of the most uh, useful criteria, <laughs> right? In school, you weren't allowed to cheat, right? And how was cheating defined? Taking or using or borrowing the work of anyone else in the world. And that makes sense. They want to know that you're doing the work, you're doing the learning. But when you get past school, and I would say actually even in school, but especially when you, when you leave school, borrowing becomes absolutely essential. If you're putting on a big conference, you don't want to invent reinvent the wheel of how to put a conference. You want to borrow, you want to, you want to be influenced by all the best practices out there. If you're writing a book, if you're putting on a play, if you're you know, doing a one-on-one -on -one review with one of your employees, you want to borrow as much as you possibly can the existing models and best practices and tips and all the, the valuable thinking that other people have done on the topic. Third criteria, we're kind of going clockwise here, is, is this easily lost, right? So the example I give, you know, 
I have a user's manual for my car, or I did when I had a car last year. And that is this 500 page, 500 page tome that, you know, I could find a digital version and I could add that to my second brain, but it's really not necessary. That's not, that's sort of a, a kind of information that's for a very specific use case for a very specific situation, such as I need to figure out how to, you know, change the washer fluid in my, on my windshield wipers. It's best to just put that where in the glove compartment of your car. Right. So we're not trying to centralize every single little piece of information in your life. That would be completely overwhelming. We're trying to get the things that don't necessarily have a place, the quotes, the interesting theories, the sci-fi stories, the, the screenshots, the, 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 the kind of stuff that just needs to be part of this creative treasure trove of things um, that you look through when you need inspiration or you need an idea to use. So I ask myself, is this something that I'm unlikely to find in the future? And that could be inspiring, useful, the other criteria. And then the fourth is personal, right? So, so this gets back to the question of why not just Google stuff? Isn't Google the best, you know, second brain that was ever invented? And the problem, not the problem, but the limitation of Google is everything on Google, everyone else on the planet has access to, right? It's all public. There's no, there's no competitive advantage there. It's, it's just public, completely universally available knowledge. What this fourth criteria points to is there's certain kinds of what's called embodied knowledge, contextual knowledge. What is the, the wisdom, really, you could say, the life experience that is unique, that is personal to you, that is hard won through often mistakes and failures and risks that you took? That kind of stuff is really, really valuable to save because it is uniquely valuable to you. Okay. So I've shared that criteria before, but I want to get a little more specific now. Um, I did this analysis yesterday, actually. I looked through the last 100 notes that I had taken um, between, I think, January 27th and March 23rd. So just about two months, which suggests that I take about, uh, about 1.5 notes a day, right? Or two notes a day. And these were the, the sort of categories, the groupings that I found. And in a minute, I'll show you examples of each one of these. Um, 14 distinct groups. Uh, I think these might be able to be grouped or sort of condensed. It would be nice if it was the 10 types or the seven types or the five types. Um, but this is my, my early stage research into what are the specific kinds of things that I save. Okay, so let me show you what this looks like. Okay, so this is the, the notebook that I created. You should be able to see my screen now. Um, of the last hundred notes I took, it says created yesterday, but that's just because I duplicated them. So you can kind of get a sense of the quantity. You know, it's, it's a fair amount, but it's not an overwhelming amount. And I want to show you this sort of table of contents here and show you what some of these look like. Oops. Okay. So I just put them under these headings. Let's take a look at one or two examples of each. The first one is marketing assets, okay? If you have any experience with marketing, and I would suggest that every single person in the world now is in some sense into marketing, whether it's marketing your product or your service or marketing yourself or marketing your ideas or your opinions, um, marketing is sort of permeates modern life and modern, modern business. And with marketing, so often you can come up with certain things on the fly. You can think of a headline. You can think of a way to frame something. But the really powerful stuff in marketing is assets, is these things. I'll show you this example. This was a, someone forwarded to me this, this YouTuber and thought leader. His name is Ali Abdal. He has a very cool uh, YouTube channel on note taking, which you should all follow. Uh, someone sent me that he had mentioned me and my work in his newsletter. So this is a really cool thing. Think about this. You can't buy this kind of, this kind of marketing. This is a, a valuable asset. Someone has put their name and their reputation behind me. So this is the kind of thing I definitely want to save. A marketing asset that includes testimonials, 
uh, case studies. It might include success stories from your customers. It might include lists of top features, top, be uh, top benefits. It might include uh, all these sorts of things that you can't necessarily come up with yourself, but over time are hugely valuable. I actually have a whole notebook of these. Every time I, I start a new marketing campaign or do a launch or anything like that, one of the first things I do is go through that notebook and see how I can, how I can use those assets in my marketing. Let's pick up the pace here because we have a, a number of categories to cover. Um, second is mementos. This is kind of just little personally meaningful things that I keep. For example, um, my recent ebook, The Heart is the Bottleneck, was the number one in, t uh, let's see, time management in business. It was the, one of the top 100 free ebooks. That's a big difference for like an hour. <laughs> But still, it's like a small win, right? It's something that's meaningful to me to see this here. And so I just took a quick screenshot. Um, and this is something that's personally meaningful. And I could also potentially use it as, as a marketing asset. Um, there's a category of just sort of reference and record keeping. This is stuff that is not necessarily creative fuel. It's not necessarily, oh my gosh, this is the most inspiring thing. But you just kind of need it around. You need to just keep it because you reference it often. People ask you for it often. Um, I'll give you an example here. Uh, every time I publish a, an ebook, for some reason, a lot of people can't download it because they haven't set their country. If your country isn't set on Amazon, then you can't download free ebooks. So every time we get that flood of messages, I have my personal assistants uh, send them this and say, try this. If you're getting the error message, this title is not currently available for purchase. So this is an example, very utilitarian, very practical, but it saves me a lot of time having this here instead of having to, or my assistant having to type out this explanation each and every time. Uh, here was another one. The, I sent an email to, the, um, to my email list when we had to cancel a meetup that I did in Singapore uh, last month. And this is the kind of email, you know, it took me 10 or 15 minutes to write, but I could use this as a template. You know, most emails you write, either you've done before or you're gonna do again. And I really like saving emails as templates. You can see this here. I'm gonna go through these, um, these 14 types and then I'll pause for any questions before I move on. Uh, a third or fourth category or type of digital note is new content. You know, often new content isn't like, oh, I'm gonna create a new work. I'm gonna write the next great American novel. But it sometimes just kind of emerges. It pops up in the course of your daily work. Um, so an example here is this. I just had this idea, whoa, what if you, there was this new model of knowledge work that was all about a feedback loop. And I have this, this kind of image in my head of a circle with different parts of the circle feeding into other parts. It's very, very early but I, I just kind of wrote some notes here, literally just in the flow. I think I was processing my email and then I just popped over to Evernote, spent like three minutes writing this out furiously, getting my ideas onto the page and then I switched back. So you can see, you, you can kind of get over that hump of you know creating a new thing, quote unquote, by just popping little notes, little things that come into mind into, into a note like this one. And this is really where most of my new, my new content starts. It starts as a little idea. This is an example where a lot of people have said this quote was very impactful for them. It's a quote from one of my blog posts. So I just said, let's write a new post on that. And I'm starting to just put a few bullet points. Okay, a one, two, three, four, fifth type is repurposed content. This is, this is where notes really become valuable, right? Often you have a piece of content that you put on your blog that you get some good reactions to and you realize you could put that over on social media or something on social media you realize can go on a podcast or something on a podcast can go into a book or something from a book can go into an event. You know, content, it's funny, it's such a dry word, content, and yet it, the, the, the dryness of the word points to the fact that content is, is infinitely kind of mutable. It can be repurposed and translated and converted into almost anything. You know, when I look at the, the top content marketers, that's kind of one of the hot, you know, marketing kinds of marketing these days is content marketing. They can get one piece of content and turn it into like 10 different forms, right? It becomes a listicle, it becomes an audio file, it becomes a YouTube video, it becomes, it becomes a Pinterest post. 
Uh, it's like you don't have to come up with completely new ideas and, and substantive content each time. You know, the medium is the message, which means every time you translate it into a new medium, it becomes valuable in a different way. So let's look at some of these. Um, so this was one, I was just going through our discourse, which is our online discussion forum for our courses. And I was going through and, and picking out some of like the top posts, the posts that people, that people were most engaged with that found most interesting. And I'm probably going to turn these into blog posts, right? I don't want to be the only one creating content for my audience. I'm looking for what they're giving me for what they're contributing. And then I'm sort of elevating it and giving it a bigger platform. Um, so one of these posts that I'm going to be doing is how to do hands-free note-taking, which has been one of the most common requests is how to take notes hands-free. And this actually was before the coronavirus. Now it's even more relevant. Um, but I compiled different uh, ideas that people had that I'm going to be compiling into a blog post. So repurposed content is very, very powerful. Uh, the next one is favorites. So this is a integration I have with Instapaper where when I do the heart, the little favorite button on Instapaper, it saves it to a special notebook that I have called Instapaper Favorites. So if you see like this, this article, these aren't my full notes on this article. It's just the title. It's a, uh, the first ex excerpt. Uh, it's a timestamp and it's the link back to the original. Um, so I have a notebook in my personal Evernote account that has, I think more than 300 of the best, the only the very best articles that I've read over the past three or four years, which is super valuable for many reasons. One is when someone asks me, Oh, what do you recommend on X or what do you think about Y or what's the best thing you've read on Z? I don't have to go and think about it and go through my, I don't know, my, my full past archive of things I've read. I can just pop into my Instapaper favorites notebook and I can send them um, not my full notes because often I don't want to share my, my full notes. I want to share them just share with them just the original source and that would be as easy as sharing this note just going note and share. Okay um, call and meeting notes right that's just kind of a utilitarian simple thing to keep as you're on calls as you're in meetings. You often don't know what's going to be valuable. You don't know what the takeaways are going to be. You don't know which information you're going to act on. This is a little note that I've been keeping with little freight. It's not, it's not comprehensive, extensive word by word notes. It's just small things that book publishers who I've been having calls with have said that I want to think about. I want to incorporate. I want to potentially use that language. You know, th these are quotes. These are ideas. They've said just some, some useful things from those calls. Uh, con contributions of others. This is a great thing. Often someone will say, well, why don't you do this? Or here's an idea. And you don't exactly know what to do with that yet. It's sort of just something you want to stew on. So I'm launching a podcast later today, actually, the first season. And I put the description on Twitter and said, what do you think? And people just tore it apart, as they will do, and said, it's all about you, 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 when it should be about me as the listener. And a couple people uh, offered, or in, in this case, just went ahead and did it to rewrite my description for me. I mean, this is amazing. Uh, you can do this if you have a big Twitter following or even just on Facebook. Most people have, you know, in the hundreds of friends, if you ask for feedback, often they'll give it to you. And in this case, I think I'll, I'll borrow many parts of what he, he said, because it's actually an improvement on what I have. Contribution of others, language to borrow. So this is interesting. One, sometimes you don't actually you're not actually saving the idea. Like the idea isn't the thing that's most powerful. It's just the way that it's expressed. It's the way that it's communicated. So there's an example here. You might be surprised that this is a, this is a note, right? It's literally a note where the title is the same thing as the content and the content is two words. Uh, and I think I just saved this by clicking on the little Evernote little menu bar here. I was in, this, in the flow of something else. So I just hit the menu bar, typed it out here, and then went about my business. But the reason I say this is I just like, I like that term, flexible toolkit, right? It's extremely simple. It's very self-explanatory, but also kind of cool, kind of impressive, kind of nifty. Um, and so language, little, little turns of phrase, little metaphors, analogies is one of the things I most like to save because language can be absolutely repurposed. It should be repurposed. I mean, we only have a finite number of letters and words, right? Um, so I, I like keeping things like that. 
So language to borrow, um, helpful models. So you can see this, this is the big one. This is the, the mother load, right? Um, and part of the reason this is so big is working on the, you can see many of these, all the ones that start with forward were emails that I saved. And most uh, mainstream notes apps have a feature where you can just send, you can forward an email directly into the notes app. You don't have to copy and paste. You don't have to use an extension. You just go, you just do, you know, command F, you type in a special custom email address they give you, and then you hit send, and then it pops up in your notes. That's how I saved all these emails. Um, but the, the reason there's so many helpful models uh, in this case is for my podcast. You know, when I started my podcast this week, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Podcasting is not my main thing. Writing is my main thing. So I just said, you know what, let me not reinvent the wheel. Let me not do any deep research. Let me just find all the best practices, borrow from what other people are doing and use those. So let me show you an example. Um, so there's, there's actually a, um, a number of models for a number of different things. We started a scholarship program. So I, I, uh, I borrowed Marie Forleo's B-School. She had a wonderful email about her scholarships that was super helpful. Let's just look at, um, look at one of these emails. Ah, so I ended up buying a course from Pat Flynn, who's one of the thought leaders with How to Start a Podcast. And he sent me this email, which I forwarded to my notes. And it's, it's interesting because this was originally about podcasting. But what I liked about this email, which is the email he sends you when you enroll in the course, is it's it's just a, mo a good model for that. It's a good model for what to send someone when they purchase from you, right? It's a, it gives you a clear call to action, just one link to click. It's pretty short, not too extensive, so it doesn't overwhelm them. It's very friendly, accessible language. So instead of sitting down and going, okay, how do I write this email? I'm going to adapt large parts of this, right? This isn't, there's nothing in your copyrighted. It's just an email. Um, and I can use this as a really powerful model for my own course. Um, but let's find something specific to podcasting. So here's one. This is a spreadsheet that he shares inside the course, which is sort of a, a way to keep track of your podcast episodes and what you're going to publish each week. This is something that I kept because um, I wanted to use it for myself. So that's one example. Uh, another one is, um, I mean, even things like this was an article on Amazon Prime, which you might think, okay, that has nothing to do with me. I'm selling online courses. Amazon Prime sells products. But the, the similarity is that I also have a subscription program. It's called Praxis, which is my blog. Um, and I, I found some things. I forget exactly what it was here, but I found some little insights about how they grew Amazon Prime that I can apply to my own subscription program, even though it's in absolutely infinitesimal in size. So you can see this, this ability to translate, to repurpose content from one place to another. It means that you can learn from anywhere. You can learn from almost any source. Um, placeholder. So <laughs> this is an empty note. This is something that has no content. You might think, what's the purpose of that? Sometimes you just need a place where you're going to start writing things. I ended up actually not using this, but this was a placeholder, an empty placeholder that I created for planning the season one of my podcast. Uh, let's see what else we got here. So research inspiration, right? Sometimes you're just reading something. This is kind of like the earliest stage of your note taking. You're reading something and you have no idea how you're gonna use it, if you're gonna use it, how it could potentially be valuable. But this is why I, I, the, the criteria I really teach in the course is anything that resonates with you. Anything that kind of, you notice here, your pupils dilating, your heart beating a little faster, your skin, you know, your, something happens with your, your skin tingles. Those are signs that something is, is sort of changing your mental model. Something is breaking your current understanding. Something surprised you, basically. And that is an excellent criteria for saving something, even if you don't know how you're going to use it. So this was a recent article all about theme parks and how theme parks are going to become digital. And there were lots of fascinating insights here. I haven't gone through and summarized it yet, um, but this is an example where I really don't know how I'm going to borrow from digital theme parks, but there is something I believe relevant there to, to my business. You can see, you know, lessons about publishing a book. Um, this was a, an interesting uh, article I read about 
a special kind of font called Sans Forgetica that uses a principle called desirable difficulty. So this is an example where I'd had this idea for a long time, and I this idea that it's not always best to make learning easy. Sometimes learning get, is best when it's hard. But that goes against the conventional wisdom. That goes against most people's thinking. And so I didn't have a way to express that. So when I came across this sentence and this term, desirable difficulty, this light bulb in my brain went off and I realized, oh, okay, so I'm not crazy. There is this principle that, um, that when you make something harder, the learning actually gets better. So that's an example where I can, I can borrow that concept. Okay, so these last three, they kind of are in chronological order. Research inspiration is just like when you first learn about something, when you first read it, then when you decide to take action, it can kind of go into planning or what I call reorganization. Um, so let's look at an example here. Um, so we recently did, uh, we, re we redesigned my blog and my website. And so I went through my blog and I just found what were some of the key posts, what were the series, I kind of analyzed what were the topics. I didn't have this before. I didn't have kind of an index of the main topics that I write about. So this note was really used to, to plan or to reorganize. And I got these topics and I turned them into tags on my blog. So you can see, you know, the, the note taking and the little brainstorming and, and, and outlining that I did here went directly into a public facing thing, which is my blog. That's planning and then once something has been planned, you need to actually prepare. You need to actually you know, bring it together and put it into some sort of agenda or some sort of outline. So you'll notice many of my recent events and new kinds of content that I've published here. For example, I did an interview with Zanke Ahrens and I asked people to send me their questions beforehand. Uh, so you can see it's kind of in a few different fonts. That's, that's because it was taken from different email addresses and messages that people sent me. Um, but this was basically what I had in front of me as I was interviewing him. I had the, the key questions that I wanted to ask him bolded. Okay, so I'm going to share at the end of the call this note along with this full notebook so you can explore all these notes to your heart's content. Um, you're going to find actually a lot of good stuff in here, even independently of how to take notes. Um, it's kind of a window into my workload, into my my flow of projects over the past couple months. Okay, so we're 30 minutes in. Let me pause here. I can feel that as my computer, all the fans start going crazy. I can tell the questions are exploding in the chat. <laughs> um, so let me jump into the chat here. Go ahead, I won't be able to go, to go back, but go ahead and ask any questions that you'd like to see answered before I move on. So notes that are no longer useful that, that themselves have been repurposed, that's what the archive is for. So if you're familiar with my para system, actually, if someone could grab the link to my para article and put it in the chat, I'd appreciate that. But my para system is all about separating what's active, what's hot, and what's not active, what's cold. As long as you make that separation, and it will generally be, you know, one to 10% is actually active, around 90% is not active. You still wanna keep it, which is why you archive it instead of deleting it. Deleting is really scary, very painful, and there's no reason to delete things. You wanna just archive it so it's not front and center and distracting you and taking up your precious attention. Which categories do you feel are career agnostic? That's an interesting question. I think they're, they all are. I mean, I, I think many of my examples were for sort of solopreneur, content creator, thought leader type lifestyle. Um, but the, the range of people that I work with in my courses, I, they, they find very much the same categories, I would say. You know, you might be having a project instead of starting a podcast, the project is, you know, how to design a, a, um, an experiment in the lab or how to put on a, an event for their catering business or how to, we had a pilot who was like, how does, how does he plan his flights, his flight itineraries? So I think that it's the same principles and the same categories of content, it's just the actual content itself is what changes. So we're gonna talk about linking in a second. Uh, we, I will make the recording of this call available, so don't worry about that. Um, oh my gosh, there's so much here. <laughs> so this is why we have a five-week course. <laughs> 
it really does take five weeks to to kind of not not just explore and understand, but to customize. You know, that's that's really the thing, and why I can't I can't usually give you an exact prescription. I can't say step one through five. Note taking is so personal. It's so embedded in your daily life, your daily routines, your personality, your temperament that we have to customize it. We have to personalize it for yourself. You know, I use Evernote. There's many cases in which Evernote is not the best app, right? Um, I think we have around three dozen different note-taking apps and even other kinds of apps that people use in the course. Over three dozen different kinds of software that people are using to build their second brain, which to me is just incredible because it, it shows that there's not just one path, not one way. There's as many ways as, as, as there are people and what we can do on these live calls is share and different people can show how they've adapted the principles to their own software and to their own life. Okay, um, I'm not gonna get to even a fraction of these questions. Please keep them coming um, because after the call I will go through the chat and if there's anything interesting, I may, I may answer those questions in a, different, in a different venue, but I do wanna be sure to get through what I have. So let's continue. Okay, <clears throat> so I want to talk about the fundamental difference between paper and digital notes. You know, we just talked about all the many different kinds of content you can save from all the different locations, all the different types. And in a minute here, I'm going to show you how easy that is. But the, the fundamental difference between paper and digital notes is that so much of this has been automated. Right? I'm working on a post now where I kind of talk about this, but I can, I can think of, I can identify nine things that you used to have to do with paper notes that are now completely automated or mostly automated. The capturing, right? Before you would have to, you'd have to actually write things out by hand. Um, now, as I'm going to show you in a minute, with the click of a favorite, with the forwarding of an email, with a few clicks on a web clipper, you can save large amounts of content in, in seconds. Um, not 100% automated, but like 90% automated. Um, I identify, you used to have to deal with, uh, with ID numbers. If you know the Zettelkasten system, you know, every note has this long sequence of letters and numbers and digits that was required to be created up front for that note to have an identity. Now with software, every single note has an ID number. It's not really visible to you as a user. But the, 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 the software keeps track of identifying which note is where completely in the background. Um, titling, right? You used to have to think of a title. I, I don't even hardly think of titles. Many of my notes are untitled or they just use the title of the original article or book. Or sometimes it's a string of letters and numbers from wherever I took that from. Um, titling is now something that can be done either automatically or you can just think of whatever um, because you don't need the title to, to be able to find that note. You can do a search of the entire note. Citing has been largely automated. So if you save a web clip or an article on Instapaper or something from a Kindle ebook, it will in most cases keep the source of that note right there inside the note. That's something that computers can do very well is just save the, the source link. Um, searching has been automated. Think about, you know, sometimes people talk about tags. Tags were invented back in the 60s because we didn't have efficient search. You couldn't do, there was not enough computing power to do a search of an entire, say, database. You had to be able to search only the keywords. So basically human, human time was the thing that was plentiful and humans were used to, to, to tag and to put keywords. Now, every single word in the entire text is a keyword, is a tag. You don't need a tag anymore. You can search 100% of your database in about half a second. And that has completely freed up our own time for more creative activities. Um, linking. Linking used to be, you know, in, in the old paper index card system, copying by hand an ID number from one place to another. Now, linking is at most right click, copy link, and paste it where you want to link to. Right? It's, it's something that's been completely abstracted away from, from paper. Um, indexing, you used to have to create an index. You needed a table of contents that you had to manually update, you had to manually add to. Um, now you can, in Evernote for example, has a, a table of contents feature. You just select the notes that you, wanna, you want a table of contents for and you can, you can see those. Uh, moving, 
right? You used to, if you wanted to move a note, it was a highly fragile, highly risky endeavor. Now you can move content from one note to another. You can move a note from one place to another. You can get a notebook and split it in half. You can get two notebooks and combine them. All of this can happen without breaking any links and without losing any data. Think about how much time that's freed up. Um, and finally, sharing. Think about what it used to take to share. What did you have to do? You know, either copy it by hand, use a photocopier, take a photo. Now you can save the, the full note in its full detail with just a few clicks to, their, to, to any person's email address without you losing the original or, or risking any, you know, losing any, any of that any of that content. So I have this cool graphic to say that most of this has been automated. Okay, so, you know, I'm actually going to skip ahead because I have an example of this. Let's look, how, let's look at how this looks like. So I'm gonna show you four examples, four of the most common types of things you might wanna save. Um, this is the, kind, the free Kindle app on an iPad. Uh, it's a free app that you can download. The same process uh, works if you have an actual Kindle device. But let's say you're reading a book. This is a book that I was reading recently called Profit First. Let's say you're, you're scrolling through in the evening and you're reading. If you put your finger down and just drag it, there's a built-in highlighting feature to Kindle. And it will highlight whatever you put your finger over. Then you hit that share button at the very top right and you share to email. You can choose different citation styles and it generates this email. This is the point where in the to field there, you put that special email address that Evernote gives you, that OneNote gives you. Uh, I don't think Notion has one yet, but they're working on it. Uh, you put in that special email address, you hit send, and those full highlights and only the highlights, only the parts that you said you want to keep get automatically added to your, uh, to your notes. So that's an example with, a, with an ebook on Kindle. This is an example of an online article. Let's say you're on the metro, you're, on, you're in the car, you're waiting at the doctor's office, or you're you know, at, at, at a meal, um, and you are reading an article on your phone or on your tablet. So let's say you find this on a blog or on social media, and you kind of scroll down and you see, oh wow, this is a super long article, I better save this for later. What you can do is hit the share button, this is on iOS, and save it to Instapaper. You saw it said saved at the top, it was very fast. And then over an Instapaper, which is what's called a read later app, an app for reading stuff later, you can see it pops up right inside the app in this nice clean, you know, white on black format that's, that's easy on the eyes. Um, Instapaper also has a highlighting feature. More and more apps are supporting highlighting these days, which is very fun. And you, you highlight just the parts you wanna save, And then when you're finished, go over to your notes app and there are the highlights from the article right there in your notes app. And this was accomplished using a little integration, which is called IFTTT. We go over many, many of these integrations in the course, um, but basically, oops, it's replaying. Um, it's a free integration that you just have to set up that connects your Instapaper account to your Evernote account. It takes just a minute, it's completely free, works completely in the background after it's set up, um, but there are a few little things that you have to set up, and then every single highlight that you make in Instapaper will be automatically uh, saved in Evernote, or you can use other dig digital notes apps. Uh, let's look at a third example, which is a web page. So this is a free extension called Liner. Getliner.com is the, is the website. And sometimes you don't really wanna save an entire article for reading later, but if you hit that little highlighter icon, your cursor becomes a highlighter and anything you select will be automatically highlighted as if it was paper. Once you're finished, you can go over to share, hit your notes app of choice, it says export was successful, and then within a few seconds, those highlights get saved in your notes. And the cool thing about this is now this is yours. Now you can change this. So in this case, I might bold something because that's the most important part. You know, I'm, I could add images, I could add my own words, my own thoughts, and then I can even share this excerpt. So think of the difference. You know, when you send someone an article to read, if it's long, the chances they're gonna get to that are pretty low. Whereas if you, if you share just an excerpt with the best part already summarized, 
in my experience, that person is far more likely to read this, far more likely to get value out of it, and it kind of increases the effectiveness of your recommendations. One last example is from a PDF. So let's say you're reading this PDF, you're going through and you decide, you know, these, these factors are something you want to revisit in the past. Um, this is using a, an app called PDF Expert. You do, you do have to pay for it, but there are other PDF readers that are free. Um, you can add your own notes. And then once you go to share, you can share only those highlights. Th this is the key thing. You don't want to share the whole thing. You don't want to share entire chapters. You want to share excerpts. You want to make use of the attention you're already spending to identify the best parts and forward and save those best parts only to your digital notes. And what you see here is if you ever need to go back to the source, you can always do that. You can always do a search and find those highlights just as you've saved them. So those are some exa examples of how to save content. Um, we have a, a, an app called Readwise. It's a service, costs five bucks a month that we're huge fans of. We're gonna be doing a workshop with them soon where we kind of go over the best practices, but many of the things I showed you are free, but if you want it to just be taken care of, you want it to be automated to just work in the background, I highly recommend Readwise because they can essentially take care of many of those, those little setup and integration things for you for only $5 a month, which if you think about, you know, how many hours a month do you spend consuming information? I mean, the average person spends, uh, I think it's 11 hours a day on their devices now. Um, what is $5 when that $5 is gonna allow you to save the best of what you read? So to kind of summarize, this is the toolkit. Um, this is a new slide that I came up with. Um, I think there, there's a range of sort of, uh, of tools that you need to save different kinds of content. Uh, on the left is voice memos. You could use a voice memo app. Most, most smartphones have them. A transcription app, that's one called otter.ai, which turns your audio into text, which I really like. Uh, moving up is, is you need a PDF reader for PDFs. You need a rate, read later app for articles. Um, there's different scanner apps that are quite useful. This is one called Scannable, but really they're all the same. Basically, you take a photo and it turns that photo into kind of a scanned image um, that you can, you can search. Drawing is a cool thing to save. This icon is for an app called Notability that I quite like. It's less focused on text, more on drawings and sketches and different things. Screenshots, this is one made by Evernote called Skitch, uh, which I like, but really there's, there's a whole range of different ones that I, that I like to use. You need an ebook reader. The two dominant ones are Kindle and iBook, iBooks, or I think now it's called Apple Books, which um, have built-in export features. And then finally, websites. There's the Evernote Web Clipper. Notion also has a Web Clipper. Microsoft OneNote has a Web Clipper. Most of the main apps do. Bear has a Web Clipper. And then there's kind of this niche of web highlighting, which is saving only certain passages of text, which I like to use Liner, which you can find at getliner.com. That's kind of what I think of as the toolkit. So let me pause here. I know I'm moving very fast here. Time flies when you're having fun, I guess. Um, but I will share these full slides. I'll share this recording and I'll share the chat. So what questions do you have? What can I answer before we move on? So Notion and whatever notes app you use is, is the bottom of that funnel, right? That's, that's where everything goes. And that's really, you know, when sometimes people ask, why do I need a digital notes app? Can't I use, you know, Google Docs? Can't I use um, the folders on my computer? But the real strength of digital notes app, whether it's Notion, Bear, Microsoft OneNote, Simple Notes, Evernote, uh, Apple Notes, Google Keep, all the, this category, when I say digital notes apps, the, the, the main thing they allow is diversity, right? There's no other category of software that is made to keep this universe of different kinds of content from text to screenshots to attachments to handwriting to links to format like formatted text. There's almost nothing that you can't put into these apps. And that's what creativity means. Creativity doesn't, isn't enhanced when every kind of content has its own little silo. You need to see things juxtaposed. You need to, you need to see diverse kinds of information overlapping and sort of falling on top of each other and comparing and contrasting. Think of how an artist works, you know, like, like throwing uh, paint onto the, uh, onto the canvas. 
mixing things around. Think of when you play Scrabble, right? You get the letters and you just keep moving them around because once you get a certain combination of letters, the possibility jumps out at you. That's what we, what we want to do with information is just be moving, you know, kind of different kinds of content in the same place. So notes review process, great question. Absolutely no time to cover that here. <laughs> That's the entire last third of the course I teach. So we spend a week and a half on that. But if I had to say it in one sentence, I would say don't review your notes. Just retrieve them just in time at the last minute when you have a specific project or problem or challenge. And that's, that's actually the moment, you know, the, these systems where you, you know, once a day or once a week or once a month, you're just sort of reviewing flashcards. To me, that's just insanity. I have way too much to do in this life to sit there sort of like pedantically reviewing flashcards. Um, and, and this has actually been a challenge because it means that I can't really give you a schedule. I can't really say do it in your weekly review, your monthly review. It's much more opportunistic. It depends on the exact projects and challenges that you're, you're undertaking at any given time. Um, notability, I really like notability, but you know, there's a whole, this whole sort of subcategory of kind of notes apps for tablets. There's, um, let's see, there's notability, there's good notes, there's this whole category, but those are very different because they're, they're really about drawing, right? So much of the, the style of note taking that I advocate is text. It's copying and pasting text and images and links. And when you get, get on the tablet, you, you're really drawn, you're sketching, you're handwriting. It's much more visual, which I, I really love that category. But I would say do the drawing on those apps and then save those drawings back to your digital notes apps, right? Like this is the thing that, that, that I think sometimes people miss. Your second brain is actually not one piece of software. I'm very sorry to, to overcomplicate this, but your second brain is an entire constellation of apps, right? Gmail is part of your second brain. The Google search is part of your second brain. Your calendar is part of your second brain. You know that's the case because how do you feel when one of these things is not available? Don't you feel like a part of yourself is missing? Right? If you can't access your calendar, it's like, it's like you're missing a limb, right? So your second brain is this whole constellation of apps. They all play a part. They all play a role. I'm really not advocating only use one piece of software for everything. That would be completely insane. We all use dozens of kinds of software. But at the end of the day or the end of the week or the end of the work session, if there is an asset, there's a resource that you think could be reused in the future, save that back. Like your digital notes is sort of like the HQ. It's like the home base that everything comes back to. Uh, e even though you use all these different kinds of software, it all gets saved. The content gets saved back to your digital notes. Okay. So let me just finish up and then I'll tell you, I'm seeing some questions here about the course. I wanna spend the last few minutes talking about that. I will stay after the hour to answer any questions um, that you guys have, but I do wanna end the official portion on the hour. So let me get to that. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the why. So, I have this idea that information, we've sort of gone past information overload. Information overload was this, this concept invented, I think in the nineties probably, that we had too much information to pay attention to. And overload, I think, doesn't really describe how bad it's become, right? Overload is sort of an abstract word. It's like system overload, the database is overloaded. Now I think the, the better term, the more accurate term is exhaustion. Um, this is something I've been researching. I, I, uh, I wrote a summary of a book called How Emotions Are Made. And one of the takeaways from that book is information has a physiological effect. When you hear, I mean, this is probably not news to anyone in the midst of the current uh, coronavirus situation, but a piece of news, a story, a worst case scenario, a a piece of information can have a direct biological impact on, on what's called your body budgets, on the balance of resources in your body. So when we talk about information overload, it's not sort of this abstract, you know, far away idea. I think this has come down to your quality of life. It's come down to the quality of your sleep, the quality of your relationships, your peace of mind, your presence. If you do not learn to manage the information flow through your life, 
you will increasingly feel exhausted and overwhelmed on a deeply visceral, physical level. <clears throat> Just to put some numbers to it, although I think we all understand what I'm talking about, we now consume on average per day the equivalent of 174 full-size newspapers worth of information. We spend 11.8 hours per day consuming media on our digital devices. And that's equivalent to about 113,000 words. And of course, this is increasing. It's not standing still. It's increasing by about 2.6% per year. This is according to a study by UC San Diego in 2014. So it's probably already, you know, 20 or 30% higher than these numbers. And yet there's this interesting thing, you know, we're told some of the digital experts, the thought leaders, they tell us um, to abstain, to, to say, you know, to just turn, they say these kind of simple rules, which I completely understand, you know, turn off your device, uh, only check your email so many times a day, um, don't spend more than this many hours looking at a screen. And yet there is, there's something clearly pulling us back to those devices, which I call FOMI, which is kind of like FOMO, fear of missing out, except it's the fear of missing information, right? So much of our lives now happen online. So much of our communities, our relationships. I mean, I created these slides before the coronavirus, but now it's even much more true. So much of our lives take place online that it's not really realistic to abstain to treat technology as, as something you're just not gonna engage with because so much of our lives are happening there. So there's this tension, you know, we want information and it's actually, it's, in, it's interesting that FOMI sounds just like the word in Portuguese, which I'm Brazilian, so my family speaks Portuguese, sounds like the word for hunger, FOMI. And isn't that what it feels like? The, the addiction to information, it's, it's a kind of gluttony. It's a kind of craving. It's this, this craving for the very thing that is hurting you, right? You, you, you want it, but you also know that it's not good for you. you, you you're seeking it, you're, you're desiring it, you're craving it, even at the same time that you know it's not the best for you. It's this, this really difficult tension that we feel. And the big picture, and we have the, the eighth and final unit of, of the, core, the building a second brain course is, is kind of dedicated to the big picture. What does this really mean for our lives, for our families, for society, for the world, for the future? And a lot of it comes down to having the mindset of a curator, right? Instead of letting informa the information from outside just hit your brain directly, instead of just loading up Twitter or CNN or the news or whatever it is and just drinking whatever is, is there, it's, it's kind of like going out to the, the gutter on the street and just like, you know, drinking up whatever is flowing down the street you actually create a buffer, you create a barrier and filters between the outside world and your mind so that you can strategically engage with information. You can engage with, engage with it intentionally when and where it suits you. And we don't have time to really get into the deep implications of this, which are very deep. But when you become more of a curator, your attention shifts to what's public, right? Everything online is public. It's everyone shouting with the loudest loudspeaker they can possibly find. Your attention shifts to what's private, towards books, towards newspapers, articles, information that's a little slower moving, a little less sensationalistic. Um, you switch from the novel, from the notification, little badge, from the new, from refreshing your feed, towards stuff that is more timeless. You find that when you read things that are timeless, they stick around. Your notes are more, are richer. They're more wise. They're more useful across a long span of time rather than just being, you know, interesting in the moment. You move, as I was saying, from what's sensationalistic, right? So much of online media now, of media in general, is designed to hook you, to capture you, to keep you engaged. There's all these psychological tricks. When you have these, these sort of steps that you take your notes through from intake all the way to to output, um, you, you start to pay attention to things that are more subtle, things that require developing ideas rather than snacking on ideas. You actually engage with your thinking. You start developing your thinking over time. Imagine that. Um, rather than only kind of reacting to what is happening in the moment. And another big shift that, that often takes people by surprise, even if they don't think of themselves as creators, you know, they don't have a blog, they don't have a podcast, they maybe never even post anywhere online, 
they find themselves moving from pure consumption to digesting and to publishing and to sharing and to collaborating. And I think the reason for that is, you know, once you have the second brain and you save your best knowledge in one place, very quickly you realize just how much you have. This is something I, I love seeing the light in people's eyes go off when they realize this. Um, when they realize that they don't need to read more, they don't need to le learn more, consume, gather more. They have enough already. They have enough to share. They have enough to contribute. And they often shift their attention from consuming to digesting. So as I said, I think digital abstinence is necessary sometimes in certain cases if you need to protect your mental health. But for most of us, I think a better metaphor is information is food, right? You need information to live. You do. You need information to understand your surroundings, to adapt, to change, to learn, to grow, to produce value in the world. Um, but you have a choice over what food or information you consume. Not all food or information is made equal. Not all of it is equally good for you. So what we're really talking about here is like informational nutrition. How can you get the nutrients and the minerals and the sustenance that you need from better, more higher quality, you could even say organic, raw sources, rather than only getting so much of the stuff online, which is, is kind of junk. <clears throat> so that is the workshop. I uh, went one minute over. And I'm going to stick around because I want to tell you, first, I want to answer any questions. So I'll spend a few minutes doing that in the chat. And then for those of you that are interested in the course, this, this is really the time. In about 12, 14 hours, we're going to open the cart uh, tomorrow morning, actually in about 24 hours. And we're going to have a cohort of, I'm, I'm estimating somewhere between three and 400, maybe up to 500 people. Imagine 500 of the smartest, most ambitious, most interesting, most curious human beings from all over the world getting on 10 calls over five weeks, plus office hours, plus bonus workshops, plus a few other things, but the basic curriculum is 10 calls, 10 one hour calls. And brainstorming about this, right? Like I start the calls sharing what I think and what I found, um, but at least half the time, half of our total time together is people sharing their own examples, their own ideas, working through challenges, me giving them feedback. That's really what building a second brain is about. It's, it's not just a one-way presentation. It is a, it is a, it's, it's a creation. It is a collaboration that we're all coming together. And I, I think really pushing forward the frontier of human knowledge. Every cohort, I learn more despite being immersed in this every day, I think, than anyone in the course. Because when we all come together and focus our attention on one thing, uh, it is really extraordinary what, what, what can, you can do. Um, I'll put in the chat here, if you want to find more information on building a second brain, you can just put your email in this, on that webpage, there's a form right at the top. Um, if, you, if you submit your email address there, I'll start sending you my seven lessons before you build a second brain. It's a series of, um, I think about a dozen emails over the course of a week and a half, where I kind of introduce you to the main ideas behind second brain. Um, but I would really love for you to join us. Uh, in the cohort, which goes from April 6th until, until May 6th. So thank you all for, for coming. As I said, I'll stick around and answer some questions and uh, either about the content of this workshop or about that course. <clears throat>